Matthew 4, verse 19. us at the Ripon Church of Christ. You are always our honored guests, and, and we rejoice that you're in our presence today. We hope that this worship service will be encouraging to you. You know, one of my favorite professional bass anglers, professional fisherman, is a man named Gerald Swindle. They call him the, the G-Man. Good old boy from Guntersville, Alabama. Just, uh, you know, living the American dream. And I, I watch him on, he, he has a, um, a Facebook page, and I watch his videos, and he's, um, they'll, they'll have him on other things like uh, Wire to Fish and other things that they will, um, you know, have videos of him. And I just really like watching him, his instruction, and just how down to earth, he is, and, and, I, and I relate to him, although I can't even fish even like him. I'm not even close. I wish I could. But he's a two-time Bass Master Angler of the Year. He won in 2004, and he also won in 2016. He's won many tournaments. You can't win tournaments without, uh, you know, or be a professional without winning uh, tournaments and without going through that, that circuit. And uh, the G-Man, he has one of the biggest platforms in bass fishing and and his popularity uh helps to support many programs and I, and that's another reason I was drawn to him uh that he I found out that he has a backpack ministry we have a backpack ministry here that Jason and Serena have set up that's very successful and he he has set this backpack ministry up and I don't know if they they do it the same way but he helps to fight childhood hunger and so he has a a heart to serve, and, and I'm drawn to him not just because he is a professional fisherman. There's all kinds of professional fishermen do a lot better than him, or place, I should say, better than him, and win more big tournaments than he does, but, but I just like his attitude. I like that he has a beard also. I like that uh, he's a country boy. He listens to country music. You know, I just re I, I, I relate to a lot that he is and, and that he's a servant in, in many ways. For people, you know, I don't know him, of course, but if if I was to sit down with him and ask him a question about when he got started, how that was, I could say, was it pretty easy to get to where you are today? You know, he would tell me how difficult it was to become a professional. I mean, how many fishermen all over the country would love to be a professional bass angler? Not many make it, just like in professional sports, not many make it. You know, he had to go through uh, all the difficulties of becoming a past fisherman. He had to sacrifice time away from his family. He had to be out on the water for so many hours. He had to have that dedication to get the skills and the techniques that he needed in order to catch bass. You can talk to Ben, and Ben will let you know on what you need to know how to catch bass. And there's many ways. There's many lures you could use, there's, but there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, you get lucky. You know, a lot of times I just get lucky. I think I throw a Senko out there and I get a fish. But, you know, it takes, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to become a pro. I wouldn't know, but I would only imagine the struggle. You know, all those times going out on the water and not even placing in the top 10, top 15, top 20, bringing no check home. Family's not going to eat, right? And he struggled through all that. It takes a, a no-quit attitude. It takes one that's going to keep going. And I could also say with confidence that uh, the G-man, Gerald Swindle, also uh, became great by uh, learning from others. And he also has taught others how to be a great fisherman. Now we look at that, that's physical fishing, of course. And when we look to Jesus, we look at the Gospels of Christ, and we see Jesus uh, coming to fishermen at the Sea of Galilee as he begins his Galilean ministry. And we see already, we talked about this before in an earlier le lesson on the Sea of Galilee. When we had 
that while on the sea. It was, I don't know, two months ago or so. We talked a little bit about this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Mark chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17, uh, Jesus sees Simon and Andrew, the brother of, of Simon, and casting their, their nets in the sea. And it says, for they were fishermen. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And of course, in John chapter uh, 21, when Simon said to the other fish, and he says, fisherman, he says, I am going fishing. We will be in Luke chapter 5 today, and I know in our classes, most of us, if not all of us, were looking at the text from the commentary. We were looking at Luke chapter 5. So we will be in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, and we're going to look at Jesus' call to discipleship. But it's not just about be, being, becoming a disciple of Christ. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you're also going to be one to go out and make disciples. You're going to be fishermen, fishers of men. And so today we're just going to look at four requirements to be an effective disciple of Christ, therefore to be an effective fisher of men, winners of souls, bringing others to the body of Christ. Well, let's first look at the first requirement to be an effective fisher of men, effective disciple. You may not be a disciple of Christ right now. If you're not a disciple of Christ right now, you're here, I guarantee you're the fish. We're going to be reaching out to you if we are, haven't already done that. That's what we do because we love you. We want you to be of Christ. We want you to be one of his followers. So let's look at the first requirement on being an effective disciple, to be an effective fisher of men. We need to listen to and learn from the master. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, it says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake again a Sarah, and he saw two boats lying on the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. Verse 3, and he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put it a little way from the land. Go out there, uh, go out there into the, uh, the water. And, and he sat down and began teaching them from the boat. So Jesus is out on this boat, and we talked about this last time. We, we talked about how in this inlet of, of this Sea of Galilee, it pretty much, the way it was situated, it was pretty much was like an amphitheater. So he was out there on the boat, and the people were on the shore, and his voice projected out to the people, and Jesus was speaking to them about uh, the Word of God. Now Peter and the disciples, they were out there, they were fishing all night, and the Bible tells us they caught nothing. You know, I've been there, Ben talked about that in class, being out there fishing all night and not catching anything. You know, I do it for fun. They weren't doing it for bragging rights. They weren't doing it uh, to hold up a picture, you know, get the, get the fish and hold up that picture like you may see in my Facebook post. You know, I'm not bragging, you know, especially the little ones I catch. You know, but it wasn't for bragging rights, right? It, it wasn't for leisure time. The disciples, they were fishermen. They did this for a living. This is how they ate. This is how they basically paid their bills, so to speak. And Jesus was preaching just off the shore. He was in that boat, and, and crowds were listening to them, and more people were, were coming in, and the number of the people listening to Jesus, it was growing. you got to think about his disciples. Have you ever fished all night long? I know some here who have. Fish all night long. No fish. You're tired. You're sore. Well, especially if you're doing what they're doing. It's a little bit different than me casting out, putting my pole down, sitting in a chair. Right? That, that's not work. They were working. They were casting these nets and, and pulling these nets in. And they were doing this all night long, sore, tired, and I'm sure they were hungry. 
and they were dejected. You know, they, they, they were, they didn't catch a thing. That must have not have felt very good. I know it doesn't when I don't catch anything, but I could go home and I could still eat. And I could rest when I get home and not worry about it. You know, I've, I've come home, and then Tracy will probably let you know this, but I've come home without catching fish for hours and hours, and I'm a little cranky. You know, I'm tired. I'm cranky. She's like, yeah. Yeah, she wants, she prays. I hope he's caught fish. Please. He's a pill. You know, and I've come home, you're a little bit cranky. You got skunked, and, and you know, you're just not in the mood. You're not in the mood just to listen to anyone. But see, the disciples, while they were cleaning their nets, they were listening to Jesus. They needed to listen to him, to learn from the master. Right? Jesus is the master. Jesus has stated, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. He says, I am gentle and lowly at heart. He's meek. He's gentle. He wants you to learn from him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 26 through 29. The first time I went fishing, I had no idea what I was doing. And I forget who I was with. I think I was camping with some people. That And one young man, he's fished. He couldn't believe I'd never fished before. I said, no, I didn't care about fishing. I said, do this. I cast out, set my pole down, and not long I catch my first fish. But I got lucky. I had no clue on how to catch a fish. It just the fish cruised up, saw my bait, and took it. The next 10 times I went fishing, guess what? Just like them, not a single fish. I started thinking, I don't know if this is for me. You know, I'm not very good at this. But what did I need to do? I just needed to listen to those who knew what they were doing. I had to listen to people who, who were basically master fishermen, you know, the ones who had been fishing for years and years. I had to learn from others. When I, when I was first fishing, after I was not catching any fish, I started to read books on, on fishing. I started to look at others. I looked at pros. I watched the, on Saturday mornings, I remember I watched Bill dance, and I watched the the end fishermen, and I would learn from them as much as I could. You know, learning and actually doing are two separate things. So once you learn, you got to put it to use. You know, me and my fishing buddy, we would go uh, fishing the very first time at San Pablo Reservoir, and we ran into this one old-time fisherman. His name when it was George. I haven't talked to George in probably 20 years. I'll never forget him, though. And George, you could say, was a master at, at fishing for trout. As I sat on the dock the week before, I actually started to learn from him and saw him catch fish after fish after fish while I was 15, 20 feet away and couldn't catch a thing. And I tell you, that was torture. But I got to learn from him. We learned from George, and we got to be friends from, with, with this man, and we would even race him to the, to the gates because we wanted to get his spot. It was pretty funny, comical. You know, one morning we're driving up, we see the lights come. I said, that's George, that's George. Go, 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 go. And we pulled right in front of him. And we got our spot, and, he, and his, his spot. And, and, you know, he wasn't very happy about that. But, you know, my buddy Chris, my buddy Chris was a really good stream fisherman. And I didn't know how to stream fish. I had no idea. He taught me how to fish the streams up there in Mount Lassen. And then that's all I wanted to do after that. I would spend a lot of my time going up and fishing the streams. And of course, you know, I don't know a lot about bass fish. I, I've caught a lot of bass, but, but not like Ben. You know, and I'd gone with Ben. I even watched Matthew school me in bass fishing. You know, learn from them. Learn how to catch fish. Learn what they're using. Learn how the techniques, and just watch those who know how to catch fish. The disciples had to listen to Jesus. How this all applies to us is basically they needed to look at the Word of God and follow what Jesus was teaching them. They needed to look to the Master. Why would they look anywhere else? You know, when you're fishing, you need to use the right bait. 
Ben, can I catch a black bass on on um, cut bait? On let, let's say let's say um, chicken liver. Yeah, I I I fished for catfish with that and never caught a black bass. But I guarantee that if the catfish is near, they're gonna hit it. You want to use the right bait. Are you gonna use like a a, a book on golf to try to bring somebody to Christ? You're not going to do it. You may golf and talk to them and show them who you are, but you're not going to open up a, a golf book and say, this is how you get to Christ. You're going to use the standard. You're going to use the Word of God. You're going to use the Master. You're going to go to the Master, the Word of God. The Bible tells us to study, to show yourself approved to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Well, let's look at the second requirement on being an effective fisher of men. We must do what the master instructs us to do. I'm sorry, I don't know why that's that's not in a little more. It had to be brought in, so I'll just say it and you know what I'm saying at the end there. We must listen and learn. That's the first thing we must do. But what, what, what does that matter if you only listen and learn? If you, if you don't bring it any further, does that matter how much you know? It doesn't matter. It, that, that's all in vain. You, you could have all these degrees and everything, and it does not matter if you don't use that for Christ's glory. See, here Jesus was done with preaching to the people, and now he's going to go to Peter because he, he sees potential in this Peter. And look at uh, Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Jesus states this to Peter. Jesus knows that they got skunk. He was watching them fish. He knows they came in with no fish. And look what he says in Luke 5, 4. He says, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. See, Peter had to learn more than what he knew. He had to look to the master. You think about this, though. Peter's a fisherman. He does this for a living. And Jesus to him, he's been following him. But Jesus to him is this good teacher. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a little bit more than just a good teacher of what he witnessed. But Jesus is a carpenter. He's saying, you're telling me how to fish? Did he say that to him? There might have been a little bit of resentment in Peter, thinking that someone else is telling him what to do. Have you ever had someone tell you how to do your job when you knew how to do that job a lot better than them? Yeah. There's people who will do that, right? I've had people actually who have never preached tell me how to preach. And I just kind of smile like, okay. You know, you kind of go, wow, the nerve. But people are like that. Maybe they, they've learned something and they want to share it with you and they come out like they know more than you know. Peter knew the best time to fish was in the shallows at night. I could say that's the best time to fish for catfish. At least, at least it's helped me. I don't go deep water at night for catfish. I usually go in the shallows. And when we're using the right bait, I catch them. I do not know what kind of fish they were fishing for. You know, when I look it up and say what kind of fish were in the Sea of, of Galilee at this time, you could look to see there's a type of carp and a type of catfish. You know, I'm not going to try to memorize and say the, the, um, the scientific name. They all said tilapia, and they had, had, had um, these sardine type of fish. But the Bible tells us that these fish were of many, and they were large fish. So it might have been carp. It might have been catfish or a mixture. Because you can't just fish uh, for a certain type of fish. And like when throwing a net, you're going to get whatever you pull in. And so they were fishing for whatever they were fishing for. And it was at night, and they were skunked. And Jesus says, go deep. He says it because he knew where they need to fish. And he's going to put the fish there for them. Throw your nets over here. And one of the um, passages says to Throw it on the right side of the boat, right? He didn't, didn't say in the deep water, but in this case, he says, 
in the deep water. Throw it out there deep for your catch. And what did Peter do? Did Peter go, no, I know what to do. I'm going to go back to the shallows. No, Peter listened to the master. He was listening to him teach. He had been following him. He had watched him perform miracles. Maybe had his ego bruised a little bit. But he listened to the master. And that word master. What do you think of when you hear the word master? Someone over you is authority. What they say goes. They command you to do and you listen to them. But basically the Greek word means to stand over. He stands over me. You have all authority, Christ. I am ready to be your servant. I am ready to obey your command. I'm going to listen to you. And the scripture tells us, I will do as you say. See, that is making Jesus the Lord of your lives. That is making him the master. He stands over us. And what happened next as Peter listened to the master? See, when I hear that word, you know, the world may think like it's just some dictator type of authoritarian, you know, taskmaster. He's not that way. He is your authority. He is your master. But he does love you. And you listen to him, and what does he do for you? He blesses you richly. Look what he did for Peter. Look at what Jesus did. He rewards the servant. The text tells us that, they, that there's a tug on the net, and they grab this net, and there's too many fish. And it was full of these big fish. They could not pull this up. They needed to get help from the other fishermen. And they came and helped. And the Bible tells us there's two boats, right? They had two boats full of fish. Then it mentioned in class, and it was, a, it was just a good visual, that this is not some little dinghy. You know, these boats were 30 feet at least. These were commercial fishing boats for the professionals. And both of these boats we're full of fish. Wouldn't that be nice, Mark? When we go to when we go to the Collins and have the boat filled with fish. Well, we can only keep our limits, so we wouldn't do that. But sometimes we struggle at just getting a couple. But this boat was full, both of them full of fish. See, they were rewarded for their obedience. Peter obeyed that command. Do you suppose that that would have happened if he went back to the shallows? It would have been the same thing. As that night before, he would have been skunked. Listen to the master. There is great reward when we listen to the master. When he instructs us to do something, we do it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us, without faith, that word, without trust, without doing. It's not just saying, I believe, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. He is that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is that God, that creator of the heavens and the earth. He is that God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Yahweh. He is, he is our everything. And if you move on faith, it says there in 2 Timothy 2.15, he's a rewarder to those who diligently Seek him. That's a promise. And your life will be blessed when you listen to the master and you do what the master instructs. Well, let's look at the third requirement. Peter's example is to acknowledge Jesus as the master over all. He's a master over everything. So, yeah, Peter was a fisherman, but Jesus was the better fisherman. Jesus knew where he needed to throw that net. And Peter realizes that Jesus is that master over everything, that he is his authority. And I think about Peter went from, okay, I, I will listen to you. I, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to, you know there's some doubt there. There had to be some doubt. You know, I know who you are, kind of know. I, I'm going to throw the net over here in the deep and just see what happens. You know, maybe he was thinking, I'm going to say, I told you, man. 
didn't work for us before. It's not going to work. You know, we didn't catch any fish. Why go in the deep? The shallows were better. He went from that type of attitude. I'm, I'm just like thinking that was his attitude. The scriptures don't tell us he had that attitude, but he must have kind of had some doubt in him that he was going to catch anything. So, wow. Look at all these fish. The master is right. Jesus showed Peter to put how to put fish in the boat. You know, and I'm not saying that they never caught fish. Of course they caught they caught fish before. They were just having a little trouble and they needed the master. And he says to do it. Peter did it. Here comes your fish. Here comes your blessing. You know, it would be unwise for me to to meet to meet the G man. To meet Gerald Swindle and to, to not listen to him. Let's say that I met him and, and he said, you want to go fishing? I said, sure. And we get out there and he's catching fish and I'm not catching fish. And he says, hey, do this. You put this one on. Go over here, watch, watch me. And he's catching him and I go, man, nah, I, I'll, I'll do it my own. I know how to catch fish. That would be unwise, I think, to do that. Especially from a master. We have to listen to the master. You know, someone else may tell us what we need to do, and we could say, okay, they, they've been, you know, one of the elders for years in the Bible, or anybody in the church doesn't have to be an elder that spent a long time in the Word. We could say, hey, you know, I mean, I learned from, from members here. Just because I've gone to school doesn't mean I'm smarter than you. I can learn from you, too. I learn from the children at times and the way they are. In Christ-like ways. Think about that, how unwise it would be not to listen to somebody who knows what they're doing. Well, it's more unwise not to listen to Jesus. Not to learn what he wants in his word and just reject it and say, I'll do things my way. I'm not going to accidentally get to heaven. But notice what Peter did in verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You know, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I feel, as I read these scriptures, I feel his humility. I feel that reverence because it tells us that he fell down at his feet and he wanted Jesus just to go away. You know, I'm not worthy to even be in your presence. Go away. See, Peter needed a change. He realized that he needed to change his life here. And he didn't see Jesus as someone that he was worthy to be in front of. Have you ever felt that way? I have. I know people in jail feel that way. You don't have to be in jail to feel that way. There's a lot of people out there that don't, they believe in there's a God. They don't feel like they're worthy. And you say, Matt, none of us are worthy. Nobody's worthy. Here Peter was in the presence of the Master. And here he was, he was experiencing his power and experiencing his glory. And he responds in the same way that other men of the Old Testament responded. The same way that Abraham responded in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 27. The same way Job responded when he was in the presence of the Almighty in Job chapter 42 and verse 1 through 6. The same way in how Isaiah responded to God in Isaiah chapter 6. The reverence for God causes repentance. It's going to cause you to make the change. If you have that for God. Peter says, I am a sinful man. I am not worthy to be in your presence, God. But I know he was giving God the glory by showing that he's his master. Amazement came upon Peter and it came upon all the other disciples as we look in verses 9 and the first part of verse 10 of our text. Yes, we are to acknowledge that God is the one who is awesome, not us. Yeah, you may have 
uh, some great qualities. You may have some great talents. Always give it to the Lord. Don't ever think that you're something. God is something. God is the awesome God. He's the one that we bow down to and give the glory to. See, He's not weak. We are weak. We need Him. If all of us cease to exist, God would still be who He is. Nothing would change for Him. We need Him. We need God and we need to know that. We need to do, live our lives depending on the Master. Christ is going to take those who are broken. Are you broken? I could tell you in ways I'm broken. Without Christ, I'm really broken. And He's going to take those who are broken and He's going to fix them. He's going to hold them strong. We're going to rely on His strength because He wants you for His service. He loves you. He's going to use you if you allow Him to use you. If you are willing to fall at His feet, are you willing to fall at His feet this day? You might already have. But are you willing to give your life to Him? Give it all for Him. That takes us to the last requirement. Being an effective fisher of men, we must follow the Master and fish. For men. Peter tells Jesus to go. He tells him to get away from him. Does Jesus listen to him? What does our loving and merciful Father do, or our, our Savior do? What does Jesus do? He doesn't walk away from Peter. He's not done with Peter. Look what he says in the second part of verse 10. He says, Do not fear. See, do not be afraid, Peter. From now on, you will be catching men. In other words, Peter, your new lifelong occupation is to reach out for souls. See, your old occupation of fishing for fish, that is going to be in the past. You're no longer going to be a fisher of fish. Now you're going to be one of my full-time disciples. You're going to go out there and you're going to cast your net, so to speak. You're going to take the Word of God I teach you. You're going to, teach all the, you're going to take all the examples I teach you and you're going to put that into your life. You're going to apply that to your life and you're going to bring in those who are willing to come to you. Those who are willing to be your disciple. My disciple. See that Greek word there for catching men. It means you will be bringing people alive to me. You're going to bring people to the one who gives life, true life to the world. John chapter 6 and verse 33. Matthew and Mark say, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. See, Peter, your life now, you need to refocus your life. You need to change your priority. What is your priority now? Your priority is me. Different type of fishing. The focus is helping to bring the lost to Jesus. The people who can be saved from their sins. And by making that change in his life, there's something else that Peter, and you know, when I say Peter, I mean the disciples too, there's something else that they need to be willing to do or they're not going to be effective fishers of men. Look at verse 11. When they had brought their boats to land, they left what? They left everything and followed Him. What was different now than before? See, before they followed Jesus, didn't they? We, we see that in John chapter 1. They were following Him. So what is different now? Why is He saying this to them now? Because Jesus is now calling them to be his disciple every day of their lives. He's calling them to leave their life as fishermen, to give up everything. You know, Luke chapter 14, if you want to turn over there real quick, and we'll be done just in a few minutes. But in Luke chapter 14, when we look in verses 26 to 33, it can confuse some people who first read that passage because the wording that the Bible uses here. 
What does he mean to give up everything? Well, let's read this in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26 through 33. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Look at verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Verse 33 says to be his disciple, you need to leave all those material things behind. That word hate. He's not telling us to hate anyone. You know what he's saying here? It applies to you and I. He's telling us that everything in this life you need to love less than you do Jesus. Jesus has to be that one you love the most. He's your number one love, even over your own spouse, even over your own children, even over your mother and father. He's not saying replace me with them. He's saying love me more than them. We all know how much we love our family. Do you love Jesus more? Are you willing to give up the things in this life that you love? I'm not telling you to give up your job. We, it, like if we keep our jobs, it's not like we're not being like Peter. It's not saying that. They, they had to follow him and trust in him. We have to follow him and trust in him. We don't have to give up our jobs. Now let me tell you, if your job is more important than Jesus, you better give it up. You better find something else. Because you're only going to have that job for so long. Eternity with Christ is far more important than anything. The disciples, when you look at disciples here, they had a successful fishing business. They had an operation. They had many men. They had two boats. When we look at uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 20, we see that they had some money, right? James and John had servants. They had money. And then their mother had to later financially support Jesus and his disciples. As we look at Matthew 27, 55 and 56, and Luke 8 and 3. John uh, knew the high priest, John chapter 18, verse 15. So he and his family most likely had business dealings with the official. And the disciples, what did they do? They left everything. They gave up this high, profitable business behind. They left it behind to follow the Master, to follow Jesus. You know, when I went to Bear Valley, there's people who went to Bear Valley who left their businesses. Very good, successful businesses behind. That would be hard to do. You know, you say, this is the way I support my family. But they knew God had a new way they are going to be supporting their family. They are going to be His ministers. They're going to be fishers of men. Is it worth it to you? Because it was worth it to them. Is it worth it to you to give your all to Christ? To leave certain things behind that may be getting your focus off Him. We are going to be disciples of Christ. Effective ones, effective fishers of men. We're going to need to do that. We're going to need to also bring others to Christ. We need to listen to Jesus. Listen to and learn from the Master. Do what He has instructed us to do. Be students of the Word. Make Jesus the Lord of your life, the Master of your life. We need Jesus. We are inadequate without Him. We need to fully depend on Him. Follow Him and fish for souls. He's not asking us a lot, is He? We just need to change. We're not doing that right now. We need to change our priorities and focus on Him and not the world. Do not let the world get you away from the Master. Our lesson today is for you. I'm going to go fishing. I have been fishing. If I need a, and I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking about physical fishing. I love doing that. That's going to be my hobby. I'm going to do that. If it ever was going to get in the way, I'm, I'm, I'm letting that go. 
because it's not worth my soul. I'm going fishing. Are you coming with me? You going to fish for souls today? I know we've been talking a lot about that. I know uh, Joe Wells, what, what great lessons, especially his Sunday one. If you weren't here to listen to Joe's lessons, you better watch them on YouTube, especially that Sunday one, having the heart of a servant. That's what it's all about, serving Jesus, being his disciples, being fishers of men. I'm not saying we're not fishing, but if you're not fishing, you start fishing today. You start doing all you can to let others know who you are, that Christ lives in you, and they're going to want that if they see how true it is in our lives. The lesson is yours today. Let's go fishing together. Let's be his disciples and bring as many as we can to the body of Christ so they could be saved from their sins. Come as we stand.